All right, philosophy of fitness, philosophy of movement, philosophy of physical education. I need to start thinking about that, developing my thoughts on the matter. But um, this is just an intro. Talk about what philosophy is, why it matters, what my philosophy is, metaphysics, basic nature of things, epistemology, how we know. But philosophy is important. It's our fundamental outlook on life conceptually. Um, as some say, you've got a sense of life as a preconceptual, emotional, holistic outlook on the world. But when we put things into concepts, we think about the way things really are. We see if our sense of life is correct or not. Because concepts give us, give us a much more abstract, general, holistic, causal outlook on things. When they're done right, of course. But philosophical outlook, fundamental conceptual view of life and the world and how we think and know. It's basic to everything. It's not merely some like airy-fairy kind of thing, some little like basic idea. Um, some people, you know, like I used to be, I didn't know what philosophy was. Some people might say they got a philosophy of fitness or physical education or teaching or education and they don't know what they're talking about. They're just given some like things that seem kind of abstract or deep to them, even if they're not. Um, but a philosophy is our, again, abstract conceptual view of the world. It's philosophy is a study of how we relate to reality conceptually. What does a conceptual rational animal need to know about the world, to function well and know the truth and be right? It's important. Look at what happens when we have a good philosophy, when we got freedom, benevolence, happiness, pleasure, getting along with people, especially like politically. Um, versus in contrast, when you got a bad philosophy and then you got disasters because people have errant and in this in these cases I'm about to give not merely errant but evil irrational illogical untrue basic ideas and then we end up with things like Nazism fascism communism um, monarchs of medieval Europe and so on based on some bad philosophies all of them influenced by the way Plato who wrote the Republic in which he laid down the blueprint for totalitarian government um, so he was thinking about real basics. What's basic and what kind of government should we have and why? It'd be like, what is a human and how should we govern them therefore? What is reality? What can we know? And he was a, you know, there's lots of people throughout the world, throughout history that have been wise, but it was in ancient Greece that they first developed philosophy as such but at least so far as I know in my study so far um, and so you know Cambodia Khmer Rouge because of some bad philosophy millions of people buried alive communist China communist Russia millions of people died starvation pushed out of the cities into the farms because the rich and bourgeois were corrupt developments you needed the the poor the proletariat to have a real revolution and push humanity forward into a new heaven on earth um so it's important philosophy bad philosophy can destroy or injure give us pain and suffering or injury that matters good philosophy can help us get along with other people know who we are know who they are know where we are in the world have a good government have good ethics live well avoid suffering and pain deal with the world well 
or look at science. We had Plato influencing Ptolemy in astronomy, and they think, oh, all we do is like make up math and like the evidence of the senses doesn't matter. It's just like the math that matters. That's the real. And we just have this math that kind of fits the evidence, but like, but reality is like messy and stupid and it doesn't follow our ideas, which are better. So we stick to our ideas. Um, and then what happens in science if you're not going to stick to the evidence of the senses and know what the world is and be immersed in it? Fail. So not much happened for hundreds, thousands, you know, hundreds of years until Galileo, Kepler, Newton, and others came along and got science right. They rediscovered Aristotle, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas about that time, um, re reintroduced or introduced into the West. And um, then Galileo knew, following Aristotle, that the evidence of the senses is where we need to look. So he engaged in a radical revolution of science. Thank goodness. Fascinating stuff. Um, we got, we look at the evidence of the senses, that's where we find things. And that's what Kepler did too. Kepler was kind of like schizophrenic scientifically, not as a person, but kind of philosophically, scientifically, he was very platonic in some ways, very Aristotelian in others. When his, with his Aristotelian element, he revolutionized astronomy because he focused on the evidence of the senses and knew, as St. Thomas Aquinas said, nothing is in the intellect that was not first in the senses. In other words, all valid concepts and ideas have their root epistemologically in experience. We know experientially and perceptually, and then we abstract away certain aspects of that and conceptualize from there and get valid concepts. Um, and Galileo believed the same thing. So he revolution. Then we're getting philosophical. That is where philosophy is, at the root of epistemology. What is a concept? Where do they come from? That is freaking genius. You know, so Plato said, experience has nothing to do with concepts. They're delude, they delude you. They mislead you. Don't listen to them at all. Make stuff up in your head make up this imaginary universe and you see how like psycho that is but um psycho wrong errant depending on the context how we want to conceptualize it and evaluate it but galileo knew that things in the world followed cause effect relationships based on the nature of the things whereas plato had a different metaphysics and disagreed. So we have things in the world, they follow cause effect relationships. We can know them from experience. And that's totally opposite to what Ptolemy and Plato said. So Galileo revolutionized the way how science was done. Galileo and some other people at the time, Newton, we knew, he knew it was based on induction, not deduction and making stuff up. Um, so philosophy is important. It can lead to success, joy, happiness, or failure, misery, and death. Um, it's not an irrelevant thing. Real philosophy matters. Philosophy is conceptualized, systematic wisdom. People can be wise, and that's what philosophy means, a love of wisdom. You love wisdom, you see what it's like to know, to judge, you figure things out systematically, everything's all interconnected, the nature of the world, how we know, ethics, epistemology, I already said that. Um, politics, aesthetics, art, you know, this whole system that's integrated and connected and consistent. Then we got a philosophy. That's what it's all about. Those are the basic ideas. So, philosophy of physics, philosophy of chemistry, philosophy of biology, philosophy of fitness, philosophy of education, so on and so forth, philosophy of psychology. Um, philosophy is important. Hopefully, that's clear. Philosophy is our basic outlook on life. It's not merely something we think is like cool or like deep. Whoa, that's deep, man. Um, it's not like that. Philosophy is what it is. It's got a certain nature. So philosophy 
as you can see in some of the stuff we've already talked about, is in a philosophy of fitness, looking at those things, we got to see who we are. What is our nature? What is this thing we're talking about that is going to be in fitness or physical education? Like fit to what? What is fit for what? Physical education, what's being educated? How is it physical? How does physical matter for this thing? What is the thing we're talking about? What kind of world is that thing in? Um, so are we talking about, as some people would say, some philosophers, um, like some animals are regarded as machines. Like Descartes had this goofy, illogical, contrary to the evidence of the senses idea that animals were just machines. And following Plato, he was so genius. He would say, I know better. You think animals have emotions and are happy and sad and they like you. It's just appearance. You're misled by experience. Following Plato, that's what Plato would say. Experience misleads you. It's full of delusions and illusions and lies. You can't trust it. So you and me, who are wrapped up in experience, we love the sunshine. It's maybe in the 60s right now, feels really good. The birds are singing, fresh air, life all around, all this shadow, all this constant change, not in a cage. You know, it's nice having a house, but it's all like dead inside. That's why people got to bring plants and animals in. So you got some like life instead of all this death, all this dead inanimate stuff. It doesn't breathe or anything. Out here, there's this like breath and life. Things are striving. It's awesome. Um, you know, we're out in this world. Now I forgot what I was saying. I got so wrapped. Oh yeah, Plato. We're wrapped up in this stuff. Or we like music. Or we enjoy food. Good food. And we like laughing and talking to friends and all this stuff and experience. So we're deluded. We're misled from the truth, Plato would think. So you and I are deluded. Um misled we can't know the truth so we have to be told what to do politics aesthetics involve being forced to do the good of these people who know better because they've got the higher insight allegedly and that's what descartes would say you think animals are like you think that thing likes you <laughs> you're misled by experience you're so goofy listen to me descartes i know better it's just a machine you can beat it and you think it's whimpering but it's just a machine. It's not really in pain. Just beat it to train it. It's okay. It's like some people call it animal abuse. <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about. See, talk about a a hole. Talk about a, we can use all kinds of other curse words, which I will not right now. Um, that is freaking unethical, evil. So there's what even today some people have that kind of idea, and. It's like a dishonest excuse for animal abuse. Um, woodpecker, beautiful. But B.F. Skinner, more recently, this well-known psychologist did some stuff. He thought animals were just machines too. And hence he could do stuff to them and it wouldn't bother him. Um, and so that's some of their ideas about how knowledge works. And notice that's opposite to what Galileo did Galileo Mary Curie Mary Curie she didn't just make crap up and sit in her office and do nothing she was immersed in experience doing stuff to get some you know like concentrate some substance down to get some radioactive material and discover radioactivity and um, discover some elements get some Nobel prizes one in physics and one in chemistry first one to get some a Nobel prize in both if I remember right um, the dog whisperer he didn't make crap up. Oh, this is what a dog should be like. A pure and perfect world and a dog. Oh, never mind experience. I just make stuff up in my head. It's like, to hell with that. Loser, you know? Um, someone like that needs to stay the hell away from any like pet I had. What we need is someone like the dog whisperer who's in love with dogs. Wants to know what they're like. Immerses himself in them. What's their nature? What's their cause-effect relationships? How do they interact with the world? How do they interact with people? 
That is freaking beautiful. That Mary Curie, Maria Montessori, one of the greatest educators ever, developed a system of education. Um, genius. I recommend looking into that Montessori education. She didn't just make crap up. She looked at the evidence of the senses, immersed herself in experience. What are children like? How do they learn? What do we need to do and develop to become an, a good adult? What is a good adult? She was asking all these philosophical questions. Same with Bruce Lee. When he was young, he was pugilistic, he'd fight. And then he got into philosophy in college. And then he got rid of his pugilistic ways. You know, he'd still fight clearly, but um, he didn't go around to fight just to fight. He wondered, you know, he was asking questions like, what is victory? Why does it matter? Um, what is martial arts? Why do we need it? Things like that. And that's when, so he was both mental and physical, like Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln had mental and physical prowess. So did Bruce Lee. Unfortunately, people don't know enough about that. Um, Abraham Lincoln, mental prowess, wrote his own speeches, some of the greatest speeches in American political history, memorized Euclid's elements. Think about geometry that you do in high school, that and more. He memorized all of it. So from what I heard, you could ask him a proof. He could give it to you like that. It was so well memorized and everything it depended on and everything it led to. And he did that so he knew what it was to demonstrate something in a law court. He wanted to be a good lawyer, a great person. He wanted prowess. I want to take care of the people who depend on me. Their life can be in my hands, their freedom, their wealth. I want to do the best I can for them and achieve and seek the truth. So to help him start with evidence, put evidence and general ideas together, evidence and laws to go through a process of reasoning to reach a conclusion of innocence or guilt or whatever, he studied Euclid's elements to see how you do that. How do you start with a diagram and some given information and develop a conclusion and put all these other conclusions together and other evidence to make some other really high abstract conclusion like what we know nowadays as y equals x squared, which is proved with very abstract, awesome geometry, Euclidean geometry in ancient times. This is in Galileo. Galileo talked about that too. Um, Apollonius. Apollonius proved when you have a cone and you cut it with a plane using basic geometry, things about circles, about um, a triangle in a circle with a diameter, um, that's one part of the uh, triangle, squares and ratios and similar triangles and on this stuff he proved basically y equals x squared, all that, awesome. Um, but. Apollonius was not Euclid, so I don't think um, Lincoln memorized that, but he did memorize all this stuff to know how to get this abstract conclusion, like Apollonius did in Galileo. Um, he got these thinking methods that would help him in law. So he was a good lawyer. He could write speech, his own speeches. He could read better, write better, think better, debate better. And that's what changed our country. It's very important. Um, and Bruce Lee, again, the th he didn't just do martial arts and, oh, I'm like strong and go around doing all this and I'm told what to do. He could not have done what he did without a philosophic outlook, a broad perspective on what is a human? What is martial arts? How does fighting and martial arts fit into everyday life? You know, he would define martial arts as expressing yourself in, mo in movement. Um, is that abstract or what? Um, and he knew that we needed ideas People shouldn't conform to ideas like conform to fads. Ideas are tools used by a human to know reality. They're, we use them, they don't use us. And that outlook allowed him to get martial arts better conceptualized and better taught and see, and he knew that the individual mattered, not the group, like for some people like Plato, the group, the collective matters or some like modern like in communism, or like Robespierre said in the French Revolution, to make an omelet, you got to crack an egg. Individuals don't matter, the collective does. The collective is what's real. Or like Hegel, you're not real unless you're part of a group. The group is the real. It's the standard of metaphysical judgment for Hegel.
but Bruce Lee, no, that's not the case. It's the individual that's real. You matter. I matter. All these individual people matter. That is awesome. That is right. Um, so the individual is what's real, and that person is who needs to be trained. And we need to think about how, what ideas and methods and techniques Bruce Lee would do for that person and not have some, like, platonic idea that you got to conform to. Anti-platonic, Bruce Lee was more Aristotelian. So, it makes a difference right there. Um, turn the other way, adjust my knees and my legs and the sunshine. But, so there's some other examples of help you see in real terms, not la-la fairy stuff, in the world, what philosophy is and why it matters. You know, again, what's real? Who are we? Look at Maria Montessori, Bruce Lee, the dog whisperer, you know? We look at the individual and adjust to them. And we are kinds of things as well. And we can use that just like the dog whisperer knows that dogs are dogs, humans are humans, we're both animals. Um, and those are things, of course, that we use to know and adjust and see cause effect relationships. It's not like every individual thing is unrelated to everything else. That's a different metaphysics. But hopefully we see philosophy is very important. Um, or look, instead of Mon Maria Montessori, her education is about helping the student learn how to conceptualize from the evidence of the senses, which they need. Look what, as I say, she did, Mary Curie, Bruce Lee, Galileo, Newton. Um, that's what we need to do. Whereas some other people, um, you know, in Nazi Germany, communist countries, you're made to conform and you're told what to do. Or in Sparta, you're taken away from your parents, you're trained to fight. Um, it's like the group that matters. And you know, it's not in the sense that we are social animals. We are self-sovereign, rational, independent, social animals. We're social, yes, but the individual is the real that makes up the group social. The social isn't the real, and we're just apparitions of that. We are real, fundamentally, in our own right. And the group comes out of that. And clearly, you look at humans, you know, we like to have other humans around. Life is better when we are in a society than if we're like trying to live alone. You know, throw someone out alone, especially when they're young, they wouldn't survive very long. We learn language, learn how to make clothing, what to eat and all this stuff. But it's the individual that is to do that and keep the group going. But, again, there's some ideas about philosophy, what it is, why it matters, the good and the bad. And then we got basically, again, who are we? Where do we live and what kind of world, what kind of place? How do we know? How do we know is a central question. We've talked about some of that stuff already. But... Philosophy of fitness, philosophy of physical education, philosophy of movement. We are um, living things. You know, we know, as some philosophers have pointed out, and some psychologists, when we're babies growing up, all we know is like shape. Our first definition of a human if we could you know we couldn't have a definition at that time because we don't know enough we don't have concepts yet and all that none of the context but human would be like a thing of a certain shape you know like the, the classic stick figure some stuff in early primitive um drawings and cave walls um just be like a stick figure that's all we know of human that's all we can and then we learn more and it'd be like 
a definition might be a thing that moves and does things that nothing else does. Because, you know, you're lying there in your crib or whatever, or wherever, and in modern times, you got a light bulb, you got ceiling and wall, window, um, some toys, uh, maybe some things come in every now and then, this thing that stays low to the ground and goes rah, 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 and this other thing that is more upright and vertical, and you see it's this one thing that does a lot of stuff that others don't. This makes different sounds. The light bulb never makes any sound. The light bulb doesn't come towards you away from you like this thing does. The other thing goes bark, bark, can like move around, but the light bulb doesn't. The wall stay the same. Um, and this one thing comes and feeds you, or you feel kind of nasty, and all of a sudden this thing does something, and then you feel cleaner, you know, your diapers change. And um, it's doing stuff to take care of you, doing stuff other things don't. This thing that goes bark, bark, doesn't feed you. It doesn't clean your diaper. Um, the light bulb doesn't. Think about what we're learning, how we know. Again, it starts from the evidence of the senses. We're immersed in experience. Um, that's what's going on as we're growing up and learning what a human is. And we don't even, you know, at that point, you don't even know you're a living thing yet. You haven't got that concept. You don't have that any experience of living versus non-living. You're starting to get it, but eventually, you know, we see that, um, so yeah, we have to eat, but we haven't connected that to being a living thing, being a thing of a certain kind, needing that to stay alive. You might have some pain, that's some information, obviously. You need to drink some water and stuff, um, eat some food. When you're hungry, it's painful. When you have water or food, then there's some pleasure, unless it's too much. And um, then you learn that, oh, there's just other things, and there's this stuff, and like, the grass just doesn't stay green all the time it's like not just like brown all the time like dirt is it can die it like turns brown and then doesn't come back or your favorite bush you got some bush or flower you like it and then it like you don't know how to take care of it and then it dies um then we're starting to get the idea of a living thing so we see that humans are living things we learn through some other steps just like i said with Lincoln um, or Galileo or geometric proof there's all these experiences and this evidence we put together into concepts and ideas and into more and more and more bring all the stuff together to see that we have we're living beings so that's who we are years into the process decades with a lot of information a lot of putting stuff together we see that we are rational self-sovereign social biological animals we are dynamic biological feedback systems um, on a much higher level of abstraction. You know, of course, we don't need that for a good philosophy of fitness. But, um, and then we're in a world where there's cause and effect. It's not how Plato thought or how some others, you know, we're not just machines, as some people wanted to say. We are living and alive. And that's going to be important in a good philosophy of fitness and for a philosophy of fitness in general yeah you know one reason we need it besides the other things if you think about what we said applied that to this bad ideas in fitness lead to frustration lack of progress injury sometimes death a good philosophy leads to good progress focusing on what we need to do being healthy um and then without one, it's not like, oh, it doesn't matter. Because look at human society today, United States, and how unhealthy people are because they don't care much about ideas or like what we are. Just do it. Or we just be fit. Everyone knows what it is. You know, the idea that to follow convention blindly, that's like an implicit philosophical idea. That's a failure. Um, to use things as an excuse, like those things as an excuse to not know to not care, to not delve into it, that's just a failure. Um, when people don't know good technique, that's when they get hurt. Not knowing philosophy or having a bad one, that makes people get hurt. Please don't do that. Um, 
Because what people are doing, when they don't have good technique and no good function to how we should move, they're strengthening dysfunction. They're, and that's setting themselves up for injury. A good philosophy, a good biomechanics is recognizing what our nature is and how we interact with the world and acting accordingly. So we're gonna have good biomechanics, good technique. We're not gonna be injured. We're gonna strengthen function, not strengthen dysfunction. Um, so it matters. And then if people have a bad philosophy, they're gonna be doing goofy things that waste time Strength and dysfunction also. They think they're doing something cool, but they just make something up and do things that cause like professional athletes to like have their career shortened because of knee injuries and things like that. Um, or I don't know if it was a bad philosophy or not having one, but I know someone I was tutoring in math, he was set to have a scholarship to play football in college and his goofy high school coach. Okay, so this guy did a PR in, I don't remember if it was deadlift or clean and jerk. He did a PR and his high school coach says, do it again, let's try for more. Like, what the hell is that? And then of course the guy threw out his back. I mean, you know, stupid. That's unfortunate, that's sad. It's like, why the hell are you a high school coach if you don't know something basic like that? But you know, it's systemic. I wouldn't necessarily blame the coach. I'd have to see, you gotta look at cause effect relationships ask five the five whys as they say it could be three whys could be 13 could be 20 basically that's like a nice name for root cause analysis ask why as much as it takes to get to the root cause of something why did that coach do that so to assume straight that oh the coach did that and therefore he's a vicious evil person is like illogical unethical unjust wrong errant you know we got to see what the cause was to know and not just um, go around accusing people right away and thinking we know everything. Why did he do that? What's the point? Then we can get the root cause. But sad, unfortunate for that kid. So it matters. Um, you know, people go to the gym thinking they're just going to do it. We just do exercise stuff. And that's again from the culture. It's a systemic failure, cultural thing. Um, people should be taught in physical education and in fitness how to move right and why it matters and how to maintain fitness all through life. Be a, have physical prowess all through life. And that may, comes from having some mental prowess because we have to know to do things right. But there's a little more about why a philosophy is important. Having one is important too, a good one. Um, why it matters in fitness specifically. Um, but, you know, we're biological. If we were just machines, we could be trained a different way. If we were just some whatever, they didn't live in a lawful world, then technique wouldn't matter. We could just do stuff and it'd be whatever. But we live in a world of cause effect, things of a nature. We have to obey that nature if we're going to be successful. Don't obey the nature, political failure, a lot of death. Don't obey the nature, dishonesty and injury, unhappiness, mistrust and ethics and among people. Don't follow that nature, injury, suffering and death, not liking to exercise and therefore not being able to help other people or help yourselves. Um, kind of being frustrated and just giving up hope, you know. No, it's like we need to love life, you know, for the sake of your love of life and everyone's love of life, for the sake of those you care about, you know, we need to have a good philosophy of fitness, among other things, um, other good, other philosophies, but it matters. What is the nature of the thing? We have a nature. We are biological animals, rational animals in this world. And we live in a world of cause and effect. So we have to follow certain techniques if we're gonna be successful and progress and not get injured. And then the important thing is how we know. 
because all that I'm claiming we know and is something that exists and is true. So the fundamental question is, how do we know? That's epistemology, in other words, is a key of, of philosophy. So we talked about like the, the metaphysics of humans, human nature, and then metaphysics in general. What is the world like? That's metaphysics. Um, who are we? What is this world like? How do we need to move? And then we'd have to get into science to refine that more to get some ideas. And that's going beyond philosophy into biology, anatomy, biomechanics, evolution, human history, anthropology. We'd have, look, we'd have to look at some special sciences to see what to do, which is so freaking awesome. All this stuff we can do. Um, and, you know, in metaphysics, that's the philosophy and then we have to get into physics and chemistry to see some particular details about what to do like we have we are of a certain nature in the a certain world and then we see technically it's oh um how does that come up there's a lever here this is physics and we got um like rotation here to some extent and we're we have a nature and we have a joint what's the nature of a joint that's going to take some special study because um, philosophy doesn't say we have joints. Physics and experience says that. Philosophy says it's of a certain nature that we have to obey and take care of. Um, fitness, human history, anatomy, physiology, things like that say how it works. Physics. Um, what's the physics of the joint? Um, how do we keep this thing healthy? How should it work? what happens when it's not used for a long time, things like that. Um, or we have a core, we have hips. And so philosophy says we have a certain nature and it's physics and biomechanics that says how hip drive comes into powering up and popping in the deadlift and squat. How we hips here upper leg, back, how we power up, like here's your legs, here's your back, we're down, um, we're going to do a deadlift and we power up with the hips or with, in a squat. Um, and then biomechanics and physics says how the hip drive helps us with everything we do, hitting, kicking, jumping, striking, landing. Um, sprinting, running, all this stuff, climbing. Um, it tells us how that all develops and interacts. Um, so who we are and the world we're in, philosophy versus some physics and chemistry and biomechanics. Biomechanics being physics applied to how we move in our biology. Um, and then again, the key question is how we know epistemology like how do we know that stuff is true how do we know we are living things and animals and then we have, to, we have to see that induction is valid and that's what we should do to have a good fitness training it's got to be based in experience based in induction not some kind of platonic nonsense where oh this is pure perfect exercise this is how I conceive of a person looking and being fit therefore this is what I'm gonna to do to people um, it's a total fail we need to be immersed in experience and see what do people do to be healthy what do Olympic athletes do what if what did humans do through history and evolution to get where we are what's the heritage of our ancestors that's so important and so unfortunately neglected um, or what do animals do good thinking it's going to be inductive and it's going to look at the big picture. That's part of epistemology. The true is the whole, as Hegel said. Hegel was wrong on a lot of things, as I said. But at least not metaphysically, but epistemologically, the true is the whole. Truth is based on whether something's true in reality. It's a connection to the world. Is your idea an identification of something real? And it's part of that for some estimation concepts and abstractions necess necessitates looking knowing connecting it to everything else we know 
things should be connected without contradiction to everything we know consistently that's good epistemology getting things from the evidence of the senses concepts and inductions putting things together into a big picture you know just like for Abraham Lincoln to do what he did he needed this he needs this whole total interconnected law case no contradictions consistent and all this stuff this whole bigger picture of reality has got to be embedded in it for Sherlock Holmes too to do a case he had to have a bunch of concepts and inductions formed to bring into that criminal case in the first place and he had to engage in this massive connection of ideas to see what happened and why get this cause effect relationship and see who did it and why what's the cause of this crime and validate his thinking prove it as much as he can um, and that was in context of everything he did if he didn't know about hats couldn't happen if he didn't know about soil and dirt couldn't happen if he didn't know we walked around on earth couldn't happen if he didn't know there were humans and they had different prof professions couldn't happen all this totality of background knowledge was involved in what he did and it's you know that stuff was necessary knowing that people had free will people had choice um, we lived in cities and stuff like that a lot of that wouldn't come up explicitly but it was implicit and necessary for how we know it's like he's trying to show that someone's a criminal how do I know that's the case you got the particular case but this other stuff that's absolutely necessary for him to know that too um, so that's the case here with fitness um, induction matters connecting things to the everyday world so look at anthropology look at biomechanics look at human history what do we need to survive in animals how, you know don't just think oh I breathe like this and breathing sucking in air so I'm fine no what do horses do when they breathe what do dogs do what do cats do what do what have people done through history what do experts say about breathing expand our context um, that's an important thing about epistemology and about how we know and the evidence for the senses is valid contrary to Plato and a good development of that some of that is in the work of JJ Gibson I haven't studied all of his stuff I need to read his books see what his philosophic influences were I'm not sure how I disagree with them how I'd agree but some stuff he did was 100% legit valid because unlike some nonsense you hear um, JG Gibson knew that direct experience was valid so he's Aristotelian so some people have this goofy idea that you don't experience this stick or this he the heaviness of this they have this goofy idea that knowledge it's like you're in a movie theater watching a movie so you're sitting here and there's a screen and that's all you see you don't know reality you just know the screen they call it indirect perception that's what some people believe you don't know reality so they got the so you know that when you lift this you know it's heavy you're directly experiencing it's heavy I know it's heavy I know about its characteristics I can tell by moving it how symmetric it is and stuff you can even close your eyes I don't have to see it I can tell moving it around where the leverage and momentum is and how the weights concentrated in three dimensions what do I got to do to move it like here versus I can't pull it up here I can lever it up I can't but I could lever it up this way but it's harder here things like that I'm directly experiencing it that's proper epistemology but some people believe that here <laughs> there's a movie screen and you're kind of like experiencing you know using vision as an analogy it'd be for like something similar for feel instead but you're experiencing the heaviness you're seeing the heaviness on a movie screen not experiencing it yourself which is like that's so weird but I mean and what animal does that you know if you like get real and look at the big picture animals don't going around go around like being aware of like some movie theater thing they know what's there hawks red-tailed hawks broad 
winged hawks, great horned owls, mountain lions, jaguars, bobcats, common buckeye butterflies, um, catfish, all this stuff, you know? They have direct experience of the world, and you know you probably do. Um, to know why some people believe some of this goofy stuff, you gotta know the philosophic tradition and what people are studying and how they're kind of lost and they're part of the group and following fads and stuff like that, you know. We're social animals, we do group stuff. We need reason to keep it right though. Some people don't have reason. They're not logical, they're not in touch with the truth. They're doing the group thing and want to be part of the group crowd, you know. It's like, unfortunately, look at human history, there's a lot of that. You know, I mean, it's good because we're group animals, it helps us, but we got to use reason to keep it connected to the world and not have this like weird inbreeding small like stereotypical small town kind of mentality about what we do um you know fads or traditions or conventions divorced from reality conventions would be fine if they're legit and philosophically correct and scientifically correct but um and how we know we have direct access to the world we don't have indirect when we pick up a weight we know um oh speaking of caterpillars here's one i forget what this species is i've seen it before the name's not coming to me now i'll have to take a picture if i can still find it when i'm done here but i think this is a moth not a butterfly but anyway so cool beautiful again life in abundance out here um so we have direct perception the work of jj gibson we find invariance that's one thing you know we could talk about in the future some of the how philosophy comes up what's there um you find out with especially with stuff that's not symmetric when i'm lifting something i got to find out where's things don't vary what can I rely on what's the commonality in a bunch of things and the similarities and characteristics of an object or something we're interacting with that's the same every time so I can reliably get something done if I jump off some ground and go five feet and land on a root um, how much do I need to push off? Where can I land on my feet? We need to start to train ourselves to have that commonality and all these different variations in, if I'm starting a little to the right, a little to the left, a little back, how much I'm pushing, how I feel that day, when I land, where on my foot, how I am in the air, what the temperature and all that is, um, or if, Here's a branch, and we jump, upper body, lower body, and we land, and we jackknife off and land on it. We gotta find the invariance, the commonalities in this thing. Like, when I land, where's my balance gonna be? What do I need to learn is the same every time so I can do this successfully? Where do I put my feet? Where should my hips be? What do I need to pay attention to? What are the invariants? Should I pay attention to where my hands are when I'm landing? My shoulders, my hips, my feet? What are the things that matter that are gonna help me get that, get mastery and land every time? And then jumping off and landing on something? Um, or lifting up some object, pick up some log, hand walk under it, get it on your shoulder, lift it up. Is it going to fall backwards, fall forwards? Is it too heavy? Where do I need to be to balance it, to lift it up most every time? Invariance. We directly perceive those. We know it. We form concepts from experiences we talked about with Galileo and Maria Montessori and the Dog Whisperer and Mary Curie and others um, and Ibn al Um he did some stuff, ancient Arab, Arabian scholar and scientist who did some work that influenced Newton, from what I've heard. I need to dig into it more. So much to learn, so little time. 
but um, there's, so there's some basics. Who we are, the world we're in, how we know. And I'll try to develop some of this stuff in the future. But that's a basic, long introduction to fitness. Oh, and it's good to be outdoors. That's one thing about this. Um, who we are, the world we're in, what we need to really be fit. You know, what is fitness? That's a basic question. What is physical education? Fit for what? That's one thing we should ask in philosophy. And then special sciences should help answer it. Um, Cause then we're getting into a non-philosophical question, something a special science would answer. But when we get into that, you know, we need to be fit for the total world, fit as a human. And that would mean seeing what our ancestors did in evolution to get to where we are now. What did they do to survive and thrive? We learned in a special science, genetics and all this stuff, evolution, we're still the same. So philosophy tells us we have a certain nature, evolution tells us more about what that nature is, and that we need to maintain that stuff for good genetics and epigenetics to be healthy. If we we need to be embedded in a certain kind of world. It needs to be species appropriate. Um, if we're not in a species appropriate world, then you get what's happened nowadays with a lot of people. Um, it's not the individual that's being overeating or being lazy. No, it's the, some aspects of the environment we have, the culture that's wrong, anti-human. It's not the person that's a failure. They have a chronic disease because there's screwy ideas that have given some bad things in the world to make those people unhealthy. Just like you can't take a strong lion that's strong out in the woods and put it in a small 12 by 12 cage and have it stay that way. It can no longer move. It can't get sunshine. It can't get its own food, things like that. It's not interacting with the world as it needs to to be healthy and to have a lion nature to be its species it's not a species appropriate environment so it becomes unhealthy and that's proven some zoos have figured that out some haven't unfortunately but some people used to think that oh it's an ape and uh, it's just an ape it's strong look like, like like we can just give it three meals a day like we do a human and feed it some cereal because it is a veg it eats vegetable kind of stuff it's like vegetable stuff and we just it just needs to eat you know, no paying attention to its identity. It's pretty sad. No paying attention to its nature, to its species, to its species appropriate environment. But you know, we gotta learn. I didn't know all this, it's not obvious. Um, so it's not like the people were doing this were evil. There's people didn't know better and we learn. Um, you know, you're like, oh crap, I made a mistake. Don't blame yourself, please. I mean, you can if you want, but I recommend not, unless it's like necessary and logical. But some people learned that our apes are unhealthy. Like they eat their food and they throw it up and they eat their throw up and they throw up and they eat their throw up. And why are they doing that? Why are they pulling out their hair? Why do they have these chronic diseases like people do? And some people, thank goodness, having a better epistemology and good thinking skills and, and implicitly, if not explicitly, caring about the nature of things. They looked at how apes move in the wild and they brought that into their apes in the zoo. So, okay, we can't get their exact food like they eat from where they're from, but we can get some stuff in the grocery store that's kind of the same. And what do apes do? They eat a bunch of small meals throughout the day. Hours they spend eating. So these people would put food in different places and then the ape would have to forage to go find it. So it's moving to get its food. It's having little bits over a long period of time. So it's moving as it should. Movement would be naturally part of its species. Moving through its environment to eat would allow it to be healthy. Eating and moving and being strong were like tied together. So those, since they were decoupled by some people, they were recoupled by these people in the zoo. And so then the ape wouldn't be eating and throwing up anymore because it would have the small meals which it needed. That's why it was throwing up because it needed to be eating. Like, I can't eat, I need something, so throw up and eat, and then it was functioning the way they were, moving around and not just sitting still. 
um, with the movement and they wouldn't pull out their hair and feel all psychotic and stuff and have these diseases. And you know, like dogs and cats are having more and more chronic diseases than they used to as well because of people not knowing how to have a species appropriate environment for the cat or their dog or themselves, not knowing the concept. Um, thankfully, it's something I've learned from other people. I didn't come up with, come up with it myself, obviously. But um, that's an important thing, a species appropriate environment. Us interacting with our nature, right? That comes from causation. We see things act and interact according to their nature in the world. We learn we're living things. We have a certain nature. We, there are certain conditions for us to live. And then technically in a special science, we see species appropriate environment. And we learn what that is for us. We can't just do whatever we want. That's a bad philosophy or no philosophy. I can just eat whatever we want. I can exercise a little bit and sit down. No, that's not taking into account our nature. But you know, it's not your fault, my fault. That's some ideas in the world. There's bad ideas being spread. We got to watch for, unfortunately. Um, but we got to have a good philosophy to do things right. And that's what we want, hopefully. That's what I'd like to help people do. Get a good philosophy of fitness and philosophy of physical education. Make for a better world. Each individual better. We can help each other better. Better society. We'll be strong there for each other. When we're strong, then we can help someone else. When we're more strong and competent mentally and physically, the weaker we are mentally and physically, the less we can do for ourselves and for others, the less we can do with the world, the less fulfilled life we can have, the less we can do and accomplish. So please, let's have mental and physical prowess for ourselves and help those we love have it and have a good society. When we're strong mentally and physically, we can do more for ourselves be more fulfilled, accomplish more in the world, help other people. And that's beautiful and that's what it's about. And then being indoors sometimes, being outdoors, you know, I want to do it out here. I was thinking of doing this video indoors first, but I'm like driving home. I need to make a video about philosophy of fitness. Cause like someone mentioned it a few years ago and I'm like, why didn't I thought of that? This guy from Israel, yo, you know who you are. Um, he asked me about a philosophy of movement. I'm like, I'm, I'm philosophy, it's like, but I couldn't think of much. Um, but a few years ago, I couldn't have known this. Now, I know a lot more about philosophy, more independent thinker, know more about induction, so I can dig into this more and do something that's really true and really matters. And I wrote up a interesting, a philosophy, teaching philosophy recently and it took only four to five days to have a first draft of a nice good comprehensive real true teaching philosophy you know it took four to five days only because I had decades of thinking about it in preparation and I had studied millennia of human thought science philosophy to see you got ideas that informed it as well so there's all this stuff, heritage of our ancestors, all this decades of living and thought I had engaged in that allowed me to do it fairly quickly. But after having done that, then this will be easier too. Because before, when this guy asked me, I'm like, philosophy of movement, what would that kind of be? Wait, let me think about that. Um, but I know it better now. But I was thinking driving home, like, oh, I do it at home in front of my computer. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's like, that'd be kind of a contradiction. It's like, that's not where I want to do it. To really and sometimes I'll do some videos there but a philosophy of fitness should start out in the real world where we are um, full of life where we should exercise where we should be where we're healthy species appropriate environment this is it as long as we have houses around and stuff too because like you know we're human we need stuff like that um, technology science tools thought living in a little society or tribe I'm connected to others um, being part of the world but this is where the root is this is where it starts this is where life comes from without this we wouldn't exist so we should embed ourselves 
in the biology and ecology that we are part of. We're not, and that's another thing that's like comes up in part of philosophy. Some philosophies would say we're separate and distinct from nature. We're over and above it. No, fail. We are part of nature. We are in it. We are in nature, of nature, part of nature, in nature. I already said that. But in, of, part of, immersed in nature. That's where we should be to be healthy, to be human, to be good people. And yeah, it's nice to sleep in a house to like not be in the rain and stuff like that. There's, you know, life is conditional. There's limits on what we can do. Everything's finite and limited. But spending time in, the na in nature is important. As Tom Brown, the third, says, animals are instruments played by their environment. Great phrase, so useful in so many ways, but that's another thing that relates back to the species, like the environment we're in is not species appropriate. It's not the person that's a problem. Animals are instruments played by their environment. So there's chronic disease or disharmony and cacophony in some people because of the environment that's playing them, not in the person. Every person is a beautiful symphony. They are gorgeous music embodied. The problem is the damn environment that's like making it discordant. They got the beauty in them. They got a beautiful tune. It's just scattered and destroyed and injured and made cacophonous by this non-species appropriate environment we're in. So to be healthy, to be good, we need to be played by our environment. Animals are instruments played by their environment. I am like an instrument played by my environment. So to be healthy, to be strong, to be good, get thee into a good environment. Enjoy. Be part of the inanimate death that is <laughs> our homes. It's got good stuff in it that can be protect you, but man, please immerse yourself in life. Be human, be good.